Hi, welcome to Spoiler Lab. A beautiful girl finds the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses and awakens him from his centuries-long slumber. Now she can make her deepest wish come true. Today we will recap the story of the 2010 movie The Extraordinary Adventures of Adèle Blancsec. The film takes us to Paris in 1912. We delve into the events leading up to the adventures of the film's protagonist, Adèle. And so, Ferdinand Chappard quietly walks home through the deserted streets of the city at night, having enjoyed a good game of cards and an excellent 12-year-old whiskey. Nearby, a cabaret dancer nicknamed Nini Long Legs is out on stage enjoying her candid performance to the delighted audience. The beauty has an ardent married admirer named Raymond Point Renault, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Meanwhile, Ferdinand Chappard stops to take a leak at a brass statue right in the middle of the square. Suddenly his attention is drawn to an unusual phenomenon in the sky, similar to the northern lights. In fact, these light glimmers are just an optical illusion emanating from Professor Esperandu's house. In the middle of the night, he conducts an unusual experiment by making objects float in the air with the power of his mind. The narrator tells us that this man is an outstanding and brilliant scientist, and is an expert on ancient Egypt. Most recently, he wrote a book with the evocative title Is There Life After Death? The answer to this question can be found on the other side of the River Seine on the second floor of the historical museum. At that very moment, defying all the laws of science and logic, a baby pterodactyl hatches from an ancient egg that had been lying untouched for 135 million years. At the same time, Professor Esperandu also seems to awaken from sleep in his apartment and begins to repeat every action of the prehistoric creature. The baby pterodactyl, awkwardly waddling its paws, tries to find its way out of the enclosed room. Seeing a huge dinosaur skeleton in front of him, the cub gets very scared and runs away. It stops when it sees a picture of a hovering pterodactyl. The baby immediately uses the picture as a guide. It begins to spread its wings and takes a few test flaps. Delighted, Professor Esperandu does the same. A moment later, the pterodactyl soars high and bursts out of the walls of the Museum of History. While true miracles are happening in the streets of Paris, Inspector Albert Caponi is sound asleep. On his desk lie medals for fictional services to society, awarded to him by Raymond Point Renault. Perhaps if he had fulfilled his obligations properly, he would have prevented the tragic events to come. Let's return to our couple, the dancer Nini and the secretary Raymond. The lovers are returning home after a show when suddenly their car is attacked by the hungry pterodactyl. The flying lizard rocks the vehicle, causing it to lose control and fall into the river. So far, everything seems confusing, but it is this tragedy that triggers a kaleidoscope of incredible events that center on the story's protagonist, journalist and writer Adele Blancsec. The desperate adventurer is ready to take on any adventure in search of sensational stories. This time the publishing house sent her on an expedition to Egypt in search of the pharaoh's tomb. The girl is used to trusting only her intuition, so clearly follows the instructions that are described in the book of Professor Esperandu about the mysteries of ancient Egypt. The girl's willful behavior causes negativity and wariness among the locals. Adele pursues her own goals in the expedition. She intends to obtain the mummy of Ramses II's healer, who has profound knowledge of medicine. As for the true goals of Adele, I will talk about a little later. So, the courageous journalist, along with her aides and local treasure hunters descends into the ancient embalming room, which is a secret entrance to the tomb of the pharaoh. While exploring the room, the girl finds a door with hieroglyphs. Having put together all the pieces of an ancient scroll, she manages to decipher the message and open the passage to the tunnel leading to the tomb. Having received what he wants, one of the gold diggers points a weapon at Adele, so as not to share the loot with her. However, the journalist draws the bandit's attention to the ground, which is covered with a mixture of oil and petroleum. As soon as they try to enter the dark tunnel with torches, the passage would immediately ignite. While the misguided gold diggers try to figure out a safe way to get inside and not get roasted, Adele, thanks to her ingenuity, easily finds another secret location. She leads the group into the treasury and the bandits immediately throw themselves greedily at the gold and jewels. The girl, however, intends to steal the sarcophagus of the pharaoh's healer. Suddenly the stolen jewels on the chest of one of the marauders come to life and begin to strangle him, while the other bandit sinks into the ground with the pile of gold. Adele realizes that she has to get out of the tomb as soon as possible, before an ancient curse comes upon her too, but she is stopped by the main antagonist of the film, Professor Dialu. He orders his guards to shoot the girl for attempting to plunder the tomb, and she asks to be given a cigarette as her final wish. After grabbing the lighter from the professor, the girl pushes him into the tomb and runs into the booby trap tunnel herself. She throws the lit lighter on the ground, after which flames immediately cover the passage and begin to swiftly pursue Adele. But the girl manages to jump into the sarcophagus with the mummy and it instantly falls underground with her, flying past the smashed treasure hunters. Fortunately, Adele manages to survive and her sarcophagus floats up safely while in the middle of a river. Professor Dialu, rescued from the tomb, is furious and sets himself the goal of eliminating the impertinent journalist at any cost. Meanwhile, in Paris, Inspector Caponi has lost sleep following the news of the tragic death of the prominent official. 
he interrogates the only witness to the pterodactyl accident, the slightly groggy Mr. Chappard. As much as Capone tries to preserve the honor and dignity of the deceased prefect, by noon the news of the pterodactyl attack and Point Renault's sordid affair with a dancer was all over the news in Paris. Rumors of the prehistoric creature terrorizing the city reach French President Armand Fair. The man does not believe the fantastic stories at first, but during a telephone conversation, he sees the pterodactyl in the window himself. The shocked president sends an order to solve the pterodactyl case. The message passes from official to official and finally reaches Inspector Capone, who is given 24 hours to solve the mysterious case. The first thing he does is go to the Museum of History, where Professor Menard and his assistant Angie Zborowski study the scene. They decide to hide the truth from the inspector that they discover the remains of an ancient egg and a broken window. We witness Inspector Capone once again displaying wonders of deduction and not realizing that the broken huge egg right in front of his eyes belongs to the pterodactyl. A museum employee directs the officers to Professor Esperandu, who also specializes in the Jurassic era. At this very moment, the flying lizard swoops into the old scientist's house, believing him to be his parent. When the officers arrive at his home, Professor Esperandu manages to hide the baby behind a thick screen. However, Inspector Capone decides to seize the moment and have some boiled eggs for lunch while he is talking to the scientist. The pterodactyl becomes enraged and shows up from his hiding place, deciding that the inspector wants to eat his offspring. The ancient creature tears apart Professor Esperandu's apartment and flies away, and the inspector, scared out of his wits, orders his subordinates to detain the scientist immediately. Meanwhile, Adele Blancsec returns from her perilous journey with a huge crate. To avoid unnecessary questions from anyone, she lies to the journalist about having brought a flute from her journey that paralyzes anyone who touches it. Back at her apartment, she has to listen to her housekeeper Miranda mutter about how her countless souvenirs from various countries will soon take up all the empty space in the house. The woman also tells her about the love letters that journalist Angie Zborowski, who is hopelessly in love with her, sends every day. We should tell a little more about this lad. The young man is also a talented scientist, but so far, he works as an assistant professor in the botanical garden at the museum. His passion for science is almost as strong as his passion for the adventurous Adele, who has enchanted Zborowski with her sense of humor and beauty. As for the girl herself, she is constantly on the road, and she simply has no time to respond to her suitor's feelings. Left alone, Adele gulps down a glass of whiskey for courage and walks into her twin sister's room. As promised, it's time to reveal the extravagant journalist's deepest wish. Over the course of five years, her beloved sister Agatha has been completely paralyzed and bedridden. Adele believes that, having learned all the wisdom of the world, Professor Esperandu will be able to revive the mummy healer, which, in turn, will cure Agatha of her paralysis. But this is not the whole truth of what happened to the unfortunate girl and you will find out about it a little later. Not willing to waste another minute, the girl goes in search of Professor Esperandu. At the door she runs into her admirer Zborowski, who had just left another note on her doorstep. She learns from him that Professor Esperandu is in prison and immediately rushes to his aid. The cunning journalist pretends to be a lawyer and gains a private meeting with the prisoner. She tells Professor Esperandu about the recovered mummy healer and promises to help him get out of prison so that he can begin the process of revival as soon as possible. At this point, a real lawyer arrives at the prison and the fraudulent Adele is thrown out into the street. The journalist impersonates a cook, a nun and a nurse in order to arrange for an escape, but all attempts end up the same she is thrown out of the prison gates. Meanwhile, the famous animal hunter saint arrives in Paris and promises to catch the pterodactyl. In order to track down the ancient lizard, he and Inspector Capone climb to the very top of the Eiffel Tower. The hapless police chief once again fails to eat during working hours, for the pterodactyl dumps its feces right on his head. This happy coincidence helps the experienced hunter Street Hubert determine that the ancient beast eats lamb. At night, Adele tries to sneak into Esperandu's cell again, pretending to be an officer on duty. However, instead of the professor, the girl finds another prisoner. He tells her that Esperandu is to be executed the next morning. Desperate to help her old friend, Adele decides to use the most effective weapon in her arsenal. Putting on her most beautiful outfit, she comes to the reception of the president of France himself. The beautiful girl tries by all means to charm Armand with her feminine charm and beg him for a pardon for Professor Esperandu. Just when Adele has hope for a good outcome, she notices the pterodactyl lurking on the roof of the president's residence. To save Armand, the girl shields him with her body, knocking him to the ground. But the guards perceive this as an attempt on the president's life and send the journalist to the police station. The president has no time to comprehend what happened and is more upset that his beloved dog, Nelson, has disappeared. In the meantime, Santibert and Inspector Capone dress up in sheepskin and lurk in the botanical garden to attract the attention of the pterodactyl. They don't even realize that a few meters away from them, the ancient lizard has set up a nest, where he has dragged the president's beloved dog. The young scientist Sporovsky helped the pterodactyl to set it up. 
He took the remains of the ancient egg shell into the museum yard and fed the beast with beef all these days to keep the guards safe. The distraught and tired journalist returns home after the interrogation, where she regretfully admits to her sister that things did not go according to plan. I think every one of us has, at least once in our lives, experienced the feeling of devastation that can now be read in Adele's gaze. The film does a good job of showing what love can do. For the sake of saving a loved one you are willing to do anything possible or impossible, even raising a deceased person from the grave. But when no miracle happens and nothing works, you begin to lose hope. After smoking a cigarette, Adele stands in front of the glass cabinet that holds the healer's mummy. Staring pensively at the wrinkled skeleton, the girl throws off her dresses and corset and implores the mummy to join them as soon as possible in the world of the living. The girl decides to take a bath and read her suitors Borowski's love letters. After reading one of them, the girl abruptly jumps out of the bathroom and goes to the guy's house. It turns out that in his last message, the enamored scientist told her that he had been able to tame the pterodactyl. Encouraged again by hope, Adele kisses the confused young man and asks him to take her to the prehistoric beast. After seeing the pterodactyl, Adele comes up with an ingenious plan to save Professor Esperandu. The brave girl decides to ride the beast and gives it a boa of feathers to establish friendly contact with it. To the great surprise of the terrified Sporovsky, the ancient reptile allows her to saddle it and Adele flies off on it into the night. Morning comes. The crowd gathers at the square where the execution is to take place to watch the cruel spectacle. Seconds before the queue, the pterodactyl, controlled by Adele, flies up to the square and lifts Professor Esperandu into the air, sending the executioner to the guillotine in his stead. The staff of the Museum of History cheerfully greet the rescued scholar. However, his escape does not go unnoticed and the hunter Santubert finally gets on the trail of the pterodactyl. He takes aim and accurately shoots the prehistoric beast in the chest. As the pterodactyl screams in unbearable pain, Professor Esperandu, who is connected to it, feels the same. Santubert prepares to fire another shot, but he is bitten on the leg by the president's dog. The enraged Professor Menard snatches the man's gun and chases him off the museum grounds. The frightened cries of the hapless hunter wake Inspector Caponi, who again misses the committed crime. A museum employee corrals St. Hubert into an enclosure with gorillas, who are ready to kindly explain to the visitor that he should no longer hunt animals. Adele tells Sporovsky to take care of the wounded pterodactyl and hurries off to take Professor Esperandu home so he can resurrect the mummy before passing into the next world. The girl's worries are understandable, since not only the scientist's life is at stake, but also the salvation of her beloved sister. In excruciating pain, the scientist orders Adele to place ancient objects around him and goes into a trance to communicate with the mummy's immortal mind. Adele and Agatha watch mesmerized as the professor's chair and ancient objects soar into the air. Unfortunately, at one point Esperandu's strength runs out and he collapses to the floor senseless. Despite Sporovsky's efforts, the baby pterodactyl suffers the same fate. Adele weeps with helplessness, losing her last hope of healing Agatha. Suddenly the mummy comes to life and, with a sneeze, brings the reporter out of her depressed state. The speechless Adele watches as the wrinkled man emerges from the glass cabinet and inspects the room. He tells the girl that he's been seeing and hearing what's going on around her all this time and thanks her for the pleasant moments. Adele is embarrassed, remembering that she was standing in front of him completely naked. The mummy leans over Agatha and notes their similar appearance. Adele regains hope of saving her sister, but the shriveled man admits that he has nothing to do with medicine and was an engineer during his lifetime. The ancient man introduces himself to Adele by the name Padmasis. After making himself a cup of tea, he sits down across from the journalist and asks her to tell him what happened to her sister. Agatha plunges into memories of the accident five years ago, and we finally learn about the weight of guilt she's been dragging behind her all these years. One day during a tennis match between the two sisters, Adele hit the ball particularly hard and it hit Agatha right in the forehead. As Agatha fell to the ground senseless, a long metal hairpin flew out of her hair. As a result, Agatha fell with the back of her head right on top of the hairpin, and the jewelry pierced through the girl's skull and brain. It didn't send her to the afterlife, but it did cause paralysis throughout her body. Since then, Adele has gone on the most desperate and dangerous adventures around the world to find a way to cure her sister of her affliction. After listening to the girl's story, Padmasis apologizes for not being able to help Agatha, but casually mentions that the professor's ritual was supposed to resurrect all such creatures within a two-kilometer radius. Hearing about the distance, Adele jumps up from her seat and picks up a recent issue of the newspaper. It mentions that nearby there is an exhibition of artifacts from the time of Pharaoh Ramses II. This news leaves the girl in a state of joyful excitement. At night, an unusual company consisting of a mummy of a scientist in a classic suit, a paralyzed girl and a desperate journalist goes to the museum. Padmasis enjoys the stroll through Paris at its best, cracking expired jokes. To his misfortune, Ferdinand Chappert again chooses a bad time to return home. Near the ill-fated monument on the square, he encounters the face of a talking mummy, and faints from shock. 
It seems to me that fate itself tells the man to quit drinking and playing cards late into the night. Adele wants to show her sick sister to the pharaoh as soon as possible, so she tells Padmasus to stop pampering. The ancient scholar obediently complies and, with a single movement of his hand, opens the doors to the museum for his companions. He also easily puts to sleep the guards, who rush out to meet the midnight guests. Finally, the trio enters the hall with the sarcophagi. Padmasus offers to free Ramses' entourage first, so that he may feel comfortable waking up. Opening the tombs, Adele asks the mummies if there is a doctor among them, but all answer in the negative. Padmasus gathers the bewildered subjects near the tomb of Ramses II and only then releases the pharaoh. The ancient ruler stretches softly after a long sleep and demands to know why he was awakened before his time. Adele can no longer contain her emotions and, with tears in her eyes, tells Ramses of her pain. For five years she has been tormented by guilt and tears for her sister, who is forced to live like a living dead. The girl asks the ruler to show leniency and help Agatha. Adele's sad story strikes a chord in Pharaoh's soul. He orders his faithful physician to examine the paralyzed Agatha and help her. The healer bends over the girl and pulls the hairpin out of her head. Adele screams in horror at the mummy, for she is sure it will doom her sister. Padmasus calms the girl down and asks her to trust the ancient experts. Real magic begins to unfold in the hall. The mummies use vials of Ramses' organs to create a special potion and treat Agatha's wound with it. When the entourage finishes conjuring up the girl's body, Ramses too kisses her goodbye on the lips and leaves with his friends to stroll around nighttime Paris. Adele approaches her sister's body and calls her name hopefully. When Agatha regains consciousness, she only remembers being hit hard with a tennis ball, but she does not know that it has been five years since the accident. The happy Adele hugs her sister and thanks Padmasus for helping her. The ancient scientist bids the girl a gallant farewell and joins the pharaoh's entourage. You have probably already guessed who the ancient people will soon meet on their way. As the poor man Chappard regains consciousness after fainting, Padmasus approaches him along with his mummified company and asks for directions to the Nile. Ferdinand goes back to the world of dreams, while the mummies continue their tourist walk through the streets of Paris, marveling at the beauty of the architecture. Stopping near the Arc de Triomphe, Ramses wistfully observes that the city lacks pyramids. Right there, years later, the Pyramid of the Louvre will appear. The following day, the entire city is in an uproar over the disappearance of the mummies from the museum. The president orders his subordinates to immediately deal with the new threat to Paris. Duty again interrupts Inspector Caponi from his delicious meal. Meanwhile an excited Zborovsky climbs the stairs with a huge bouquet of roses for his beloved Adele. But the cured Agatha opens the door and informs him that her sister has left on a two-week journey. The girl flirtatiously hints that his guest may present her with a bouquet. Smitten by her beauty and friendliness, Zborovsky happily accepts her invitation to tea. Meanwhile, happy with the recovery of her own sister, Adele boards a transatlantic passenger liner for a new adventure. The girl is a little nervous, because right from the start of the trip, everything goes wrong. The extravagant journalist is pursued by two men who turn out to be the associates of Professor Dialu. The scientist laughs wickedly after the departure of the ship with the beautiful name Titanic. In so doing, the story hints at the catastrophe that will soon happen to the Titanic. Unfortunately, we do not know whether Madame Adèle Blancsec managed to survive the shipwreck and whether Professor Dialu's associates were involved in the accident. However, knowing the brave nature of the main character, we can assume that she will cope with all the difficulties that await her with grace. Who knows, perhaps thanks to her merits it will be possible to revive Jack Dawson and we will see the long-awaited sequel to the movie Titanic. If you had the opportunity, which character from world history would you bring to life and why? Tell us about it in the comments below the video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to be the first to watch our new videos.